Our scripture lesson for the day comes to us from the second chapter of Acts, beginning in verse 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to breaking of bread and the prayers. All came upon, upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any who had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodness, the goodwill of all people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you join me in prayer? Oh, Lord, you do mean more to us, and uh, words cannot describe. And yet, your peace, which passes all understanding, and your love, which is too great to know fully, we experience in the quietness of these moments, in the grandness of life, in the beauty of nature, and in the love of relationships. We thank you that you've already spoken to us in the service. Give us ears to hear and hearts that would be courageous to follow you as you continue to speak wherever it is you're calling us. For it is in your good name we pray. Amen and amen. So grateful for the music this morning as always. And Andrea, what a great day that your mom could be here and here and your dad too. Yes, both. We have Christ. Yeah. It just can't get any better and until 6 o'clock tonight, so, so good. And Leo, uh, that song, I just sat there and sang it with you because I can't keep from singing, truly, and uh, thank you for that so much, so much. Yeah. Uh, so this morning, I need to begin with a confession that's always a good way to start a sermon, isn't it? Everybody's on their edge of their seat. I have the fear of missing out. Anybody else have the fear of missing out? FOMO is what the kids call it nowadays. Fear of missing out. It's been with me for a long time. I think early in my life, you know, I went from job to job to job. I'm not going to rehash that for you. But I think that was part of it. Like, hey, I, don't, I may be missing something here. I need to go there. Oh, I'm missing something here. Go there. And so I did that, and, and now I'm pretty stable in terms of work life, which is good. My family's very excited for that, but it has manifests itself in other ways. I know I'm alone in this. Every restaurant I go to in town, I order basically the same thing there. Anybody else? If I name a restaurant, could you already tell me what you're going to get before? Why even give the menus out? Skyline, two cheese conies with everything, and a Diet Coke. I mean, it just goes like Chick-fil-A, a number one, Diet Coke. Taco Bell, a number three, and Diet Coke. Do you get the sense here? I go to Applebee's, and who's kidding? Nobody goes to Applebee's anymore. I mean, even Walker Hayes cannot save Applebee's. There's no fear of missing out. You know Walker Hayes, right? No? I'm not going to sing it. Do what I, No, I'm not going to sing it. But it's like date night at Applebee's, Bourbon Street, steak and Oreo shake, whipped cream on the top, two straws, one check, girl, I got you. You That one. He's, thank you, thank you for the applause. I knew, I'm trying to get it any way I can, so yes, yeah. Walker Hayes cannot save them. YouTube, spend your afternoon doing that the, and uh, find that. But fear of missing out, it's real. It's real. I think it can creep into our church selections as well. That took a turn. <laughs> Quickly, didn't it? Yeah. How do we know that we're at a church, a church, body of believers that's going in the right direction. You see, I get the same thing when I go to different restaurants because I don't want to waste money. I don't want to be disappointed. I want what I want, what I want, and I don't want to find that I get to the end of something and I'm like, oh, I missed out. There was something else. How do we know that the church that we belong to, that we've chosen or that we're choosing is heading in the right direction, that I won't get to the end and have this, oh, it was the wrong choice. 
I'm so disappointed. What a waste of time. That would be awful, wouldn't it? And, and let's face it. We, we choose the places that we worship. A lot of it is personal preference. And there's nothing wrong with personal preference. But there's got to be something more. There has to be something more subjective that we, could, we can observe within the body of believers to say, oh, this is a place. This is a place that, that, that the Spirit's at work. I love Acts because it gives us this in-depth view of the very early church and how it was formed and how Jesus designed it to look like. Our uh, passage this morning is one of three places in the book of Acts where, where the New Testament church, the church of Jesus Christ, is described. And, and there are certain characteristics that are with any church, whether it was in the book of Acts or is there in 2023, that must be a part. There's four, four things. And they're contained in the verse 42 of Acts 2. The first is devotion to the apostles' teaching. That's what the book says. Devotion to the apostles' teaching. We're going to expound upon these a little bit. Number two, there is a, get this, having all things in common with the group. You're going to love that one when I get to that one. Number three, there is a breaking of bread, i.e., observing the sacraments. In the Methodist church, it's baptism and it is Holy Communion. Carol did a great job helping us see that last week. Let me just describe the difference between a service organization and a church. One of the quick things that you can know, they both do good things. A church will always be offering regularly the sacraments of baptism and communion. That's what makes us different, distinct. And number four, it's prayer. So as, as we're thinking, what part of the church, where should I be, how should I go? Those four things have to be a part of any church that either we're thinking about becoming a part of or that we are a part of to assess what's going on. This New Testament church, they were devoted to the apostles' teaching. That's so important. It's the place that we start. It wasn't that they were devoted to the apostles. Why were they devoted to the apostles' teaching? Because the apostles are the ones who's walked with Jesus. Just a few years back, a few days back, actually, they're the ones that exposed to Jesus in terms of all of his teaching, his healings, his miracles. They knew what Jesus liked for lunch, right? I mean, the apostles did. They knew, they knew that what made Jesus grumpy, that he was a real person, and he had his own way of doing things. They would have known that. And so the early church, these 3,000 that came into the church because of Pentecost and after the sermon by Peter, they were devoted to the apostles' teaching, which means they were devoted to the life of Jesus. They drew very close to that, and they wanted to know. And they were listening to the apostles because the apostles knew Jesus best because they had walked with him, they had talked with him, they had experienced him in the fullness. Any church must be devoted must be devoted to knowing about the life, death, resurrection of Jesus Christ. It must be at the center of everything. If Jesus is not, it's a huge waste of time. Let me tell you about fear of missing out. You don't have to have a fear. If Jesus is not in the center, we will be missing out. Number two, they were, had all things in, together. Now, I don't believe that the book of Acts is, is telling us that we need to adopt an economic model. I don't think it's that. I think it's something a whole lot more deep and more important. I think the book of Acts is beginning to describe a group of people who looked at one another as family, not based on blood relationships, but based on faith. In the best sense of the word, what do we do with family? We help them in every way. If they need something, we give it to them. If they are struggling, we lift them up. If they are celebrating, we're happy. 
And this early group of believers had all things in common, meaning that, that they treated one another like they did their own family, not because they were blood related, but because they were faith related. I tell you this morning, the church is a family. We can't get around that. And any church that follows after Jesus begins to treat each other with a degree of commitment that goes well beyond personal preference. A degree of commitment that is willing to do whatever it takes to give someone a hand up and to walk by them. That's what the early church shows us. They were involved in the sacraments. The scripture tells us that they were breaking bread together in one another's homes, which goes back to sort of that fellowship model, but it's beyond that. Remember Jesus the last night that he was with his disciples before he was betrayed and was crucified? They, they shared a meal, and during that meal, he broke bread. He said, this is my body given to you. Do this in remembrance of me every time you do this. He poured a cup. He said, this is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you for, and for many for the forgiveness of sins. And they took that to heart and participated in that meal regularly. Matter of fact, perhaps every time they gathered, they celebrated Holy Communion because Jesus had instructed them to. It was the center of who they were. Matter of fact, it's what they became known as. Some in the early church days looked at the church and thought they were cannibals. Why? Because they said they were eating Jesus' body and drinking his blood. That's how closely identified they were with the sacraments. We know that 3,000 heard Peter, repented, and were baptized. Imagine that baptism ceremony. Any church must be a church who puts the sacraments in the middle of everything with, raw, with awe and reverence, with regularity and conviction. And finally, prayer. You look at the book of Acts and any major movement of the spirit, any, any miracles, anything that take place, you're gonna find prayer at the beginning in the middle and at the end, period. Before the day of Pentecost, which led to 3,000 being added in, in this, these verses we read, guess what they were doing? 120 were in a room in Jerusalem praying. Because they knew that prayer was absolutely the avenue for God's blessing to be given. They actually took Jesus serious when he said, ask anything in my name and I'll do it for you. And they saw the fruits of that. Devoted to the apostles' teaching, devoted to one another in acts of commitment that you'd only find in families, devoted to the sacraments, the sacred holy moments that Jesus has given to draw close to him devoted to prayer. Those are the four things that have to be at the center of any church. And you're probably asking, well, where's, where's evangelism in that? Shouldn't we be out spreading the good news? Absolutely we should. Well, what about worship? That's what we're doing this morning. Shouldn't we be in the center of worship? Absolutely we should. Shouldn't we be uh, serving our neighbor? Yeah. But guess what? All of that comes through these four key principles. You see, in the New Testament church of Acts, deep always proceeded wide. And it's a key principle. Deep proceeds wide. You show me a church who's devoted to the teachings of Jesus. Show me a church who's devoted to each other and sacraments and prayer. I'll show you a church who will be beyond the walls spreading the good news, who will be in foreign countries making sure the hungry are fed. They'll be in worship that will feel like 
the cusp of heaven. Why? Because deep, being committed to those four things spreads to everything else. It's not complicated. It's not rocket science. It's really straightforward. So what does this leave us? If this is your first time at the downtown community, you could not have picked a better Sunday to come. I promise. Because this, this sermon's for you. How do you begin to even, even begin to think about a church home? I would invite you to examine this place, not just what we say, but what we do. Is there a devotion to Jesus and his teaching? And do we live it out? Is there a devotion to one another? Does it feel like family? That's a high bar, I understand. But it is Jesus' bar. Are the sacraments in the middle? Do we have a high view of the sacraments? And is prayer not just something that we do, but who we are? The Apostle Paul says, pray without ceasing. If those things are there, you don't have to worry about missing out. Jesus will be in the middle and things will be happening. It happens. That's what it's all about. If it's not there, let me say something that will absolutely sound like it just doesn't even make sense. Find someplace else. That's all I can tell you. You need to. You have to be in some place that has those four. Because those are the place where the grace of God is being spilled out and things happen like in the book of Acts, all in wonder and miracles and signs. The good news is that it's here. <laughs> you may have to look diligently. It may not just be a one week thing. I would encourage you, and I have been in your shoes. If this is your first time here, let me tell you, I have been in your shoes in prior lives and know how hard it is to find a church home. And one Sunday, you may get it all in the package and it may take you a month of Sundays, but I encourage you to be patient. Look for those four things and then be ready to respond. What if you are part of the church family here? What does this mean for us? Can I, can I just drop a few seeds out and see if anything takes? Are you ready? Can I just throw some stuff out? The world is so looking at us and they want to know if it makes a difference. Is it worth it to me to spend my Sunday mornings and my money and my energy? Is it worth it? That's a question on their hearts. Oh, there's a lot of other things that we get thrown at us, but th that's the, is there a difference about the people who are in church or part of this group that call themselves followers of Jesus? The good news is that you are and you have, and I'm convinced that you will be. I've seen that you've made a difference in my life. But, but where is it that we might take the next step personally? Is it a, a recommitment to Jesus' teaching and to following it in that way? Let me tell you my personal opinion. A church is only as strong as its small groups are vibrant. A church is only as healthy as its Sunday school is healthy. That is the place to be. Maybe your next step of involvement, of commitment, is to find a Sunday school. And, and to get to a place where you're known and you can know and you can follow Jesus' teaching closer and have a group that knows you. Every once in a while, not often, but every once in a while I'm asked, if I only have one hour a week, what should I do? You know what I tell people? Go to Sunday school. Now, please don't leave here and say, the preacher doesn't want you in worship. <laughs> it's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying it's Sunday school, that we get devoted to the apostles' teaching, that we get to know one another and we get to experience that. We've got some great Sunday schools. We would love to help you get plugged in. 
call Carol, text her, email me. I mean, any of us. We would love to help you do that. It'll make all the difference in the world, I promise. Maybe it's a commitment to one another. I mean, let's face it, our personal preferences are strong. We like what we like. But will we be known for a group who have personal preferences or have a commitment to others? Do you know what Jesus said that his followers would be known by? Their love for one another. Which means we have to take our personal preferences and set them aside at times. Is our commitment to the person in the pew going to be greater than our commitment to our personal preference? I just went from preaching to meddling, didn't I? But it's meddling for me too. I have preferences. But my commitment to you is greater than all of those. And I pray that it would continue. And I think as we grow together as a family, day by day, and our commitments to each other grow in that way. The whole world sees that. That's how you can be witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea, Samaria and the ends of the earth. Our commitment to one another. The sacraments is a growing edge for us. Can I just, can I just own that this morning? If communion is... What we say it is, not just a symbol, but a holy mystery, where the grace of God is poured out upon his people, we desperately need to be offering it weekly. However that looks, we have a wonderful chapel right behind here, Slayton Chapel. We could do that. We need to embrace the sacraments and put them in the middle as they have been in the Methodist tradition. All right, I'm going to stop on that one. Prayer. It's where I'll end today because that's what matters. Sometimes we as Methodists ask, how is it with your soul? Let me ask this question, which I think is more applicable. How is it with your prayer life? How is it with your prayer life? Are we spending consistent time not only offering up what our needs are, but the needs of those around? Have we prayed for our nation this week? We prayed for the leadership. We prayed for our enemies. Prayer is the key thing that we can do that changes all other things. May it be that we're a people that aren't just praying when it's convenient, praying when there is just something going on that we have a dramatic need, but we are praying regularly in season and out of season, preparing our hearts for whatever God has for us. You see, all four of these things aren't overwhelmingly difficult, but sometimes they get taken for granted I'm one who doesn't like routine. I love a day that changes from minute to minute because I have a fear of missing out. (laughs) Yet I fear that that in me is actually distracting from the core things that we need to be about. The early church grew because they were patient They kept coming back to these four core principles and wouldn't let them go. And you know what scripture tells us? They found favor among all people and that Jesus was adding through his spirit to their number by the day. You know what that means? More people are spending eternity with Jesus because of a group of people who were unashamedly, unapologetically focused on those four things. May it be with us as well. Lord, thank you that you do lay out for us a path and that you provide for us the power. May we be a people who take those on and move forward in your spirit. In your good name we pray, Jesus. Amen.